So, you know, so in my talk today, I'm going to share my research outcomes on telehealth communications with everyone. So as Carlo mentioned, I'm currently working at the Australian National University, and I would like to um, thank the, uh, the contributions made by my students, by my collaborator, and my colleagues, which also was on the telehealth communications. So in this lecture, what we are going to talk about is the, um, say what we are going to talk about is divided into like mainly two parts. So in the beginning, I will just talk about why do we need telehealth communications in 6G and beyond era. And after that, I'm going to share three pieces of studies which are conducted by my research group, which covers performance analysis, spectrum allocation, and hybrid beamforming. Um, so due to the time limits, and I don't uh, like put a lot of technical details in this kind of like technical works, I just will try to briefly mention what kind of problem we are solving here and what kind are the key results that we are providing in this works. So that is the outline of this talk. So to begin with, let's look at why do we need telehealth communications in the uh, 6G and uh, beyond era. So this is the world that we are living in. And in this world, in this, obviously this is a network society, we need different connections to you know, talk to each other, to move forward. And definitely if we look at our society in seven years time, 10 years time, we do need new technologies to tackle the challenges and to build up the ubiquitous intelligent connectivity. So based on that case, we have seen the evolution of wireless cellular networks from 1G, 2G, 3G to 4G, and now we have these 5G systems. And I, I believe that we, we are all familiar with like different uh, peculiarities in different generation of the wireless cellular system. And then we also have the, you know, the change of this kind of mobile phones from the very big ones until it becomes smaller, smaller, smaller. And then from here, we can see that, okay, now we can watch the video. So the mobile phones becomes larger and larger. Um, as we mentioned, we are now in the 5G era. And for the 5G, the kind of 5G systems are mainly the cellular networks. So no matter which country we are looking at, typically the 5G systems adopt the different frequency to support the cellular system, like the very low frequency, the sub six gigahertz and the millimeter wave band, like 24, I think mainly like 26 gigahertz or 28 gigahertz. We use this kind of way, the, the frequency to support the communication. So this is our current 5G systems look like. And then we know that if we talk about 5G, if we go back to a few years ago, at that time when we talk about 5G, actually we were expecting that the 5G to serve as a unifying connectivity platform for three major scenarios. So for these three major scenarios, we, we have the enhanced mobile broadband, which we try to further improve the data rate. We also have the massive internet of things or massive machine type communications, where we try to support a huge number of connectivity like IoT or wireless IoT like Carlo is currently doing. And we also have mission critical services or ultra reliable and the low latency communications. We have like, uh, like short packet communication. We have this, um, the, 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 the uh, the, like the ground free access, we have this kind of technologies to, 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 to reduce the latency of communications. So this is the reality and the expectation. Expectation is like we, we want this three to happen. And reality is that now we are using the, uh, the, the, the 5G to support cellular network only. So in this case, if we, if we try to ask ourselves like, um, we, we, we know that if we keep doing, uh, no, we know that like for 5G, um, we have the initial you know, premise of the 5G, which is the carrier of the three pillar scenarios, they have not been realized yet. And if we look at the 5G systems, it may support the basic internet of everything and the URLC services in the near future. But in this case, if we look at our ubiquitous intelligent information society, like in 2030 or even beyond, we notice that this society will be highly digitized intelligence inspired and globally data driven. And this has to be supported by the near instant and unlimited wireless connectivity. So in order to achieve that, and in order to build up this society, we find out that it is super, super challenging for us if we only use 5G to support this society because there are a lot of services which need the wireless quality which are far beyond the 5G can offer. For example, it may need the wireless system which can deliver the ultra high data rate to achieve the ultra high reliability, the ultra low latency for a massive 
the number of devices, and these devices can be human devices, can be machine type devices, and we may also need the end-to-end -end design of the system, which in incorporate or integrate different functionalities, including not only communication, but also sensing, localization, control, computing. We, we need these kind of things. So in this case, given that the 5G cannot help us to support this society, we will say 6G is indeed needed. So in terms of 6G, um, I believe that the 6G, if we talk about 6G research, the 6G research is a not very, critically speaking, it's not a very new world because when we talk about 6G, people have talked about that since like a couple of years ago, like we have this ITU focus group back in 2018. And we also have the EU's Horizon 2020 program. And we also have the US, they have opened this kind of like a spectrum for the 6G research and deployment. We also have seen some like investment and efforts from the Eastern Asia countries. We, we have seen this kind of research. So based on that, the good thing is, the good thing is that if we look at the 6G standards, which for example, uh, somehow which is currently handled by ITU, they have this kind of time, uh, timeline process. So currently we are at the 2023, uh, 20, uh, 23, um, like, like mark. So the good thing is that now we have somehow finished the, uh, the ITU have finished the framework. And after that, they are going to look at the different requirements and the evaluation criteria and to, you know, to support the enabling technology to, 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 to realize 6G. But now we're at this point, the 2023 point, which we have already got the framework, which is quite good. So if we look at this framework, just the, the framework on the left-hand side, we have seen that very recently, very recently, the ITUR has adopted a new recommendation on the IMT 2030 framework. And that was, you can see that that was adopted uh, like very recently. So in this framework, actually it proposes six use scenarios for 6G, for 6G communication, where they consider three extended scenario where they mark as green color, and they also have three new scenario which they mark as blue color. For the three extended uses scenario, they are extended from the 5G, the three scenarios from 5G, where we have this immersive communication extended from the enhanced mobile broadband, the hyper-reliable and the low latency communication or extreme communication coming from your ILC, and also massive communication coming from machine, uh, massive machine type communication. We have these three extended scenarios. Apart from that, we also have three new scenarios the ubiquitous connectivity, which we try to connect the uh, historically ignored areas. We have the integrated sensing and communication. We also have integrated AI and communication. So based on these six use scenarios, we have the four overarching aspects on the, just on the, like the, the, the boundary of the circle where we have sustainability, security slash privacy, connecting the unconnected and ubiquitous intelligence. So we have these six scenarios and then we have these four overarching aspects. So aligning with the framework, they also have these expected capabilities for 6G communication. For the green ones, they are the enhanced capability comparing to the 5G uh, like performance metric. They also have some new capability which are aligned with the new use scenarios. So I don't, I don't want to, you know, talk about these capabilities one by one because I don't have, I don't I think we have time to do that, but we just need to, okay, so we just need to mention that um, if we have this, you know, substantially enhanced capabilities, then 6G is expected to offer, then we can see that comparing to 5G, the 6G is, is much better. And we need to know that the, the, the value of these capabilities, they are the estimated and the targets and they can be further development, they can be further developed based on the real needs in the next few years. And uh, so in this case, if all these capabilities can be realized, the 6G will become a game changer to provide a more integrated features that can be used to satisfy the different needs in society and industries. So this is our, or the community's expectation uh, or anticipation about 6G in the you know, next seven or 10 years. But what will the real what will be the reality? I mean, that that is very hard to predict. But again, this is targets that we want to achieve. So based on that, we can see that for the sixty capabilities, we have some data rate which is clearly staying here as the um, like very high standard. So in the immersive communication, we believe that the key performance metric for the immersive communication 
is to support super fast transmission where the peak data rate can be as high as a few hundred gigabits per second. And for the user experience data rate, it should be hundreds of megabits per second. So based on this performance metric, we can see that the high data rate can be help us to realize some applications that require the ultra fast transmission such like immersive uh, extended reality and holographic communications. And we do need a very high data rate to support these applications. And I believe for some uh, like ex existing studies, they have checked that if like a human body is mapped in tiles, then if we try to map like a, like a full image of the, of the person, they may need a data rate of a few terabits per second. Clearly, that's something we cannot achieve in the current spectrum and using the current technology. So we need this high data rate. We need this high data rate. And then in order to achieve this high data rate, of course, we have you know, different signal processing techniques that we can use. But at the same time, people have talked about the spectrum that we can use. So in order to support the super fast transmission, people have mentioned that we, we need to consider the spectrum above 92 or even 100 gigahertz that are currently sparsely used. So in the spectrum, we may have some potential candidates that can be considered, like the frequency band between like 100 and 110 gigahertz, 140 and 160 gigahertz, a bit more than 200 and around 300. They could be potential candidates to, for us to use to achieve the super high data rate. So we do believe that in the 6G system, we, it's likely, as I say, it's likely that we may use um, like, uh, like the frequency band, like uh, close to 100 gigahertz or a bit more than 100 gigahertz in the commercialized system. And for the beyond 6G, we may use much higher frequency to support that. So aligning with this kind of like frequencies, we can see that it somehow give us the trigger about why we need terahertz communication in 6G communications. So if we ask ourselves like whether we can use the current frequency spectrum, no matter sub 60 gigahertz or millimeter wave band at 26 or 28 gigahertz, can we use the spectrum to satisfy the demand of the 6G wireless applications? Unfortunately, it's, it's hard to use that because of their relatively limited bandwidth. So based on that, we may need to explore the benefits of terahertz where the terahertz band is here. So when we see the terahertz band, um, we know that um, like different people may have different definition about what is the terahertz band. But I would say that from my perspective, I would prefer a relatively uh, like, uh, like a definition which we define a terahertz band from 0 0.1 terahertz, which is 100 gigahertz, until 10 terahertz. And I know someone talking about that. If we talk about 0 0.1 to 0 0.3, that is sub terahertz. I know that. But just, just like for the terahertz band, is something which is beyond what we are currently using in the mobile phone. And then we know that for the terahertz band, if we look even beyond that, that is the visible light communication, something like that. So based on this terahertz band, we know that the, the potential to explore this terahertz band is that we can potentially satisfy the large bandwidth that are required by some use scenarios in the 6G era. For example, if we want to support the high accuracy ISAC, the integrated sensing and communication, we may need the bandwidth of, of like 0 0.75 gigahertz. For the wide area extended reality, we may need one gigahertz. For the holographic, we may need 1.1 gigahertz. So in this case, this essentially means that 6G need to combine the, like the variable frequency range from the lower band to the sub terahertz band to, you know, to support a different kind of communication requirements. So based on this case, um, when we talk about terahertz communication, definitely we want to know the terahertz come, like what is the advantage of terahertz comparing to other frequencies? As we mentioned before, this is terahertz. On the left-hand side, we have millimeter wave. And on the right-hand side, we have visible light. Right? So comparing to millimeter wave, we see that the terahertz band can potentially provide us with a higher data rate, can have a higher directionality and a smaller footprint, and it, less, it is less susceptible to free space diffraction and the inter antenna interference, and also it has a higher resilience towards the security perspective because we want to, um, like terahertz, we want to generate a very narrow beam, like the pencil-shaped beam to the receiver. And then if we compare to the visible light communications, we know that the terahertz communication is less affected by the 
factors which are faced by visible light, like ambient light, the atmospheric turbulence, they are less affected. And it is also has less dedicated pointing, acquisition, the tracking, and it, it can explore the reflection and reprocessing a bit. So based on this case, we find out we find out that based on the potential benefits of terahertz and based on the relatively advantage of terahertz communication, we want to explore the research of terahertz communication. It's important because we want to use our research to enhance the wireless availability and the connectivity by using all the available frequency like sub six gigahertz, millimeter wave, terahertz, and even visible light in a heterogeneous way. And we can use the spectrum to satisfy the requirements that we want to achieve. So this is why we want to emphasize that terahertz communication is important. So based on this case, we know that terahertz spectrum can provide the very high available bandwidth and in this case, it can support the, um, the, the, the a few like communication scenarios or communication applications like the ultra fast, ultra fast Wi-Fi. We can use terahertz to um, deploy them into the wireless data, data center to replace the, the wired connection. We have the terahertz integrated backhaul access. We have we can also use terahertz in the space communications where um, the, 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 the transmission environment is much better. And apart from that, we know the terahertz communication has very short wave, which means the, the antennas can be very small. And in this case, we can also support, use terahertz to support the small scale communication like networks on chip and the internet of nano things. So given this importance for terahertz communications, if we want to do the research from the physical layer, we need to know how the terahertz channel looks like. I mean, again, I'm not the person who is doing uh, like channel hertz, terahertz channel modeling, terahertz channel measurement. I'm not doing that, but again, we need to know how the channel looks like in order to perform the effective and the meaningful design. So based on this, we know that the terahertz channel modeling and the characterization are important for us to know. So based on this case, let's look at how the terahertz channel looks like. The first phenomenon is spreading loss, which is easy to understand. Like when we have a higher transmission frequency, we know that the path loss or spreading loss will increase you know, uh, significantly with the frequency. So for the terahertz link, if we consider the free space loss, it can be quite severe. That is easy to understand. But apart from that, terahertz communication is also impacted by molecular absorption loss. The molecular absorption loss is caused by the polar gas molecules in the air medium. And when the terahertz wave is propagated, these molecules will somehow absorb the energies of the terahertz wave. So based on the spreading loss and the molecular absorption loss, we can see that if we jointly consider them, which is something we have to do, then we can see that it will lead to the distance and the frequency dependent spectrum transmission windows. And it look like this. So this is the path loss. This is the path loss, of course, the higher, the worse. And this is the frequency from 0 0.1 to 1.5 terahertz. And then the different colors corresponding to different transmission distance. So we can see that at some frequencies, at some frequencies, the path loss can be super high. That means the path loss is much more severe. And, and if you choose this frequency to, to, to transmit, the, the transmission would be failed. So in this case, if we want to use terahertz to perform transmission, then definitely we know that this kind of peak depends on the frequency, depends on the transmission, uh, like distance. So in this case, if we want to perform the transmission, typically we would choose some like flat, relatively flat area between the peaks. For example, this area, this area, or this area, this this area. They are can be considered as transmission windows. And it, when when, I, when we talk about the terahertz communication, six G may be something using the frequency around here, so which is quite flat. So we have this kind of like a uh, channel behavior, which we have to be aware of. And apart from that, we also know the terahertz communication, they have the clustering effects and the channel sparsity. So the line of sight uh, link is dominant. And then we also know that the terahertz propagation can be easily blocked by different objects. And if we can see the auto door transmission, the terahertz wave can be you know, scat scattered with the particles of the rain, fog, and smoke. So this is terahertz channel. We, we need to know the the, the, the characteristic when we do the physical design. And then for the standardization activities for HOE, they have the first standard back in 2017, working on uh, this frequency between 250 
353 and 322. And if you look at the ITU, the ITU opened the um, frequency from 275 to 450 back in 2019. So this bandwidth are allocated for land mobile and fixed services. That's why we predict that if we talk about 6G and something a bit beyond 6G, most likely that this frequency can be considered as the as the candidate of the of being used in the 6G or beyond systems. So that is the standardization activities. And definitely when we talk about 6G standardization, that will happen a few years later. And for the hardware efforts, and typically when we talk about hardware, we need to think about how can we generate the terahertz waves. I will say that um, for the current uh, for the current status, people have been using like about two or three ways to generate the wave. One is electronic technology, which means they generate a relatively lower frequency and then they upgrade the wave to the terahertz frequency. And some people also use the photonic technology that generate a very high frequency and down convert the, the frequency into terahertz. And another approach, uh, the third approach is plasmonic uh, technology, which can, for example, use the graphene-based transceiver to, to generate the terahertz wave directly. So that is the hardware efforts. But again, I'm not the hardware guy. I just know this, those are things very, very briefly. And I have seen some hardware advancement, like this kind of, like the front end, and also my collaborator in Northeastern University, they have this kind of like demo, um, like free, operating at this frequency, which is can be as high as one to 1.05 terahertz. So that's the hardware efforts. And based on these hardware efforts, we know that we can somehow explore the physical design of terahertz communication from our expertise. So the main research directions in terahertz come over the past few, past few years include something like channel measurement and modeling, modulation and the waveform design, uh, coding and error control, messy MIMO with signal processing, uh, performance analysis, spectrum management, security and the covenant design, MAC control protocol design, and the joint design of terrorist communication with other CG technologies like reconfigurable intelligence service, UAV, joint communication and sensing, and next generation multiple access. So we have seen this kind of research directions. So in, my, so in the second half, what I'm going to briefly mention three things that we have been doing. Uh, system analysis, spectrum management, and hybrid beam forming. So due to the time constraint, I just want to briefly mention what we have been doing and ignore the technical details. So for the system analysis, I just want to introduce our work back in 2021. So in this work, what we consider is that we perform the coverage probability analysis of downlink transmission in 3D terahertz communication systems, where we consider the terahertz propagation, including molecular absorption loss, direction beams, and high vulnerability towards the blockage. And we, we, use, we consider the effect of 3D directional antennas, and we also consider the impact of 3D blockages. So based on that, we propose an analytical framework, and then we show that the, some like insights about the terahertz communication systems. So based on this case, this is system model, system model we consider. So you can clearly see that we consider a 3D model where the typical user is standing at the center of the ground. It has height of HU and all the transmitters, we call it APs. The transmitters, they are, they are mounted on the ceiling following a post-on point uh, distribution. And we also have the users which are distributed uniformly and each AP is associated with one user. So we assume that this um, user is associate, associated with its own transmitter so in this case, all the other APs there, they can be considered as interferers. And also we consider different blockage because we mentioned that in terrorist communication, terrorist wave are very easily to be blocked. So in this case, we consider self blockage, which means the user itself can block the signal. And also we have the dynamic human blockers, dynamic human blockers, they follow a distribution and they follow some like random directional model because we assume they are moving. And we also assume they have like wall blockers. The walls are static, they, they are not moving, but they can block the signals as well. So this is the system model we consider. And then for this system model, we consider 3D antenna 
model, which we assume that each antenna it has its like main lobe and the side lobe of uh, of the antenna beam, which we have corresponding antenna gains. And for the propagation model, we can see the signal propagation, which considered both spreading spreading loss, which is something we consider in other communication, but also molecular absorption loss, where we have this exponential function and we have this Kf, where Kf is the molecular absorption loss coefficient. And the value of this coefficient, typically we, we can find that from the existing database, where the database contains the, you know, the measurement data. And apart from that, um, we just have an assumption that in this network, we just can focus on the line of sight link and ignore the impact of non-line of sight link because we we read some like existing study they show that the the strings of the non-lapse non-line of sight link may be only like one percent of the lines line of sight link. That's why we just ignore the, the impact of the non-line of sight. So based on the system model, what we consider is that we first evaluate the non-line of sight probability of a link between the API and the user. So in terms of the, if we consider both human and the wall blockers are there, the line of set link is given by this result. Again, I mean, the derivation is shown in the paper. And then based on this, we investigate the impact of the interference uh, transmitter on the aggregated interference at the user. So in this case, the heating probability is given by this case. And based on that, we assume, we, we find that, that the coverage probability can be formulated as the product of two probabilities. The first probability is that the link, so this is the same as this. So this is the line offset probability with the human blocker. And then the second one is that if the link is line offset, what is the probability that the SNR is higher than a threshold? So it is equal to this, the product of these two probabilities. The first one has been derived. The second one will be derived later. And in order to derive that, we just use the dominant interference analysis because we know that we, we cannot use the conventional methods to analyze the performance. So in this case, we partition the, all the transmitters into two subsets, dominant and non-dominant interferers. So an interferer is defined as a dominant interferer if it causes outage when none of the other interferers contribute to the interference. So that is determined as a dominant interferer. Then all the other interferers are defined as non-dominant interferer. So this help us to transform the probability as the probability that no interferer is a dominant interferer in the link between the AP and the user. So this helps us to simplify the analysis a bit. So based on this case, the coverage probability is finally derived. In this case, where we include the average number of near dominant interferers and number of far dominant interferers. We just do some transformation and get the final result. And for the final result, when we verify that, we see that our analytical result, which is this black curve, it somehow it aligns with the simulation, especially for the low and the medium distance, and it is better than the existing results that in other uh, studies. So analysis well match with the simulation results, showing the importance of our proposed 3D analysis. And we also examine that if we assume the antenna gain is a is a, is fixed. And how do we, you know, allocate the antenna gains to get the better performance? So this is our performance analysis. So that is our first work. We just uh, consider a three D model and we use a new analytical approach to evaluate the coverage probability. And then the second work is about spectrum allocation. So spectrum allocation in terahertz is that we we know terahertz have a very large bandwidth, so we need to you know, some develop the effective spectrum allocation strategy to get the potential of terahertz band. So in this case, we have typically two ways to do that. One is that some people talk about the to be allocated spectrum to be reused, like we just keep reusing the, the spectrum, but they, they have different power and different frequency band, uh, different bandwidth. So they also have to combine with the spatial and power domain multiplexing technologies. So that's approach one. For our approach, what we consider is somehow conventional in the wireless communication where we consider that the whole broadband can be divided into different subband and they are divided into no overlapping subband with relatively small bandwidth. So this can reduce the interband interference. So that is our contributions. So in order to do that, we have 
completed a series of works, uh, completed a series of works, where our major contribution is that we first consider the subband can have different bandwidth. That means some subband can be wide, some subband can be narrow, and then we can also we also consider the underutilization of the edge spectrum, which means when we talk about the molecular absorption loss or path loss, we, we have some we have seen some peaks. That means the spectrum, which is close to the peaks, they are very severe. They, they are not they are not that good to use. So in this case, we try to avoid the use of this spectrum. And based on this, we have we have used convex optimization to deal with some problem and use machine learning to deal with another problem, which is a bit more complicated. So for the spectrum allocation, I just want to bring the last work to everyone. For that work, we can see the 3D terahertz communication and one transmitter serving different users. And here, for the spectrum allocation, we can see the either the green part, SRN1, SRN2, they are the negative absorption coefficient, so they behave like this way, or the red curve, which is the positive, uh, like the positive uh, absorption coefficient, which is behave like this way. So we can see that either way, but, but I mean, the, the approach is, is the same. We can apply to either of them. And for this case, what we consider is that we focus on the multiband-based spectrum allocation, and the subband can have different uh, bandwidth, so that means like B1, B2, B3, they can have different bandwidth. And then apart from that, we also assume the users are served by different subband to reduce the interference between them. And then finally, we consider the distance aware multi-carrier based subband assignment, which means that for the sake of fairness, for the sake of fairness, we consider that um, for the subband with high absorption loss, like in, in this kind of range, in this kind of range, which is very bad, we just give to the near use, like you have a good channel, I give you the re relatively bad subband. But for the users with longer distance, with longer distance, I give you the subband in the central area with the low absorption frequency like this area. So if you have a bad channel, I give you a good subband. So you can see that this kind of allocation is to achieve a, like a relatively fairness. So based on this case, um, we just got the data rate, and then we formulated the spectrum allocation problem where we try to do the proportionally fire data rate maximization where we can see the power constraint at the transmitter, power allocated to each user, total available bandwidth, and the maximum subband bandwidth. Based on this, uh, we find out that for our considered system, it is extremely difficult to solve this problem using the traditional optimization. That's why we have to focus on machine learning. And for machine learning, we use the machine learning to solve the problem where we um, train the system using a deep neural network. So this is a network and we have the input, which is the distance vector. The output is the solution, including the bandwidth allocation and the power allocation. So this is the uh, machine learning model, which um, is, was developed by my student. And so based on that, we just go to the numerical results. For the numerical results, we can see the uh, indoor system with one, one transmitter serving 15 users. And then we can see the two, um, uh, two regions. One is SRN1, one is SRN2. We know that SRN1 has a relatively complicated molecular absorption loss, KF, which we can see goes down, rise up again, and goes down. So this is a bit complicated because we cannot use a like a exponential function of frequency to model this kind of behavior. If we want to model that, there is an error. But for the second range, we can say it's relatively smooth. So this can be modeled or relatively accurately modeled by an exponential function of frequency. So we can see the these two cases, and then we want to see how the results would be different. And there are some here are some like uh, parameters about the machine learning model. So based on this, we just compare these two regions. Um, for the first range, for the first range, we can see the SRN2. When we consider SRN2, we know that this molecular absorption loss can be somehow modeled as an exponential function of frequency. So in this case, we find out that for this case, actually we can solve the problem using convex optimization. And then if we compare machine learning with convex optimization, okay, good. They mean after convergency, these two approach 
shows almost the same same uh, performance, which shows the validity of our machine learning technology. So this is just to show that the machine learning approach making sense. And then if we talk about the second case, which is this case, the KF in the spectrum is a bit complicated and we cannot model it using an exponential function of frequency. If we want to do that, there will be an error. So for this case, we find out that our machine learning approach is better than convex optimization, where for this convex optimization, what we do is that we know that this molecular absorption loss cannot be modeled by an exponential function. But in order to make the convex optimization work, we have to model this curve using an exponential function of frequency, and we know there is an error. We know there is an error, but this is just for us to make the convex optimization work and use it as a benchmark. So for that case, we can see the machine learning approach indeed has a better performance than the convex optimization. So that shows the benefits of our proposed approach. So that's the second case where we can see the spectrum allocation and we determine how, how, how much bandwidth and how much power we have to assign in the communication system. The last one is hybrid beam forming. So hybrid beam forming, honestly speaking, is not a very new topic because people have talking about that since uh, five years ago, eight years ago, 10 years ago, when we talk about like messy MIMO and millimeter wave, we have to talk about hybrid beam forming. So for beam forming or hybrid beam forming, we know that they are needed in the terahertz communication because they can help us to compensate for the very high path loss, can help us to address the strong channel capacity, can help us to explore the large multi-path K factor, and also can it's very suitable for the very large antenna array. And based on the beam forming, then for the terahertz communication, we know that the hybrid beam forming actually is a way for us to align with the massive MIMO, and it can strike a balance between fully digital beam forming and analog beam forming to strike a balance between performance, complexity, and cost. So that is the why we use hybrid beam forming. And then for hybrid beam forming, we, we, we know that we have people have developed hybrid beam forming for millimeter wave. So if we want to do the hybrid beam forming in terahertz communications, what are the new challenges we have to tackle? We well, just listed something here. So in order to develop the hybrid beam forming or pre-coding in terahertz communication, we have to consider the unique properties that we cannot ignore in terahertz communication, such as the distance and the frequency dependent path loss that I have shown before, the beam split effect, like if we uh, transmit in terahertz and if it is transmitted using a relatively large bandwidth, the beam will be like split, split like this. And then it may also have the potential high power consumption. It, we also need to address the near and far field propagation with the spherical and the planar waves. And also we need to consider blockage. So these are the, some factors that I encourage people to consider when we design the hybrid beam forming scheme. So based on that, um, for the hybrid beam forming scheme, I just want to introduce two works. Uh, but I have to admit that, although I have mentioned these kind of factors, but it does not mean that my work, which I'm going to introduce later on, in consider all of this. Um, this is something I would suggest people to consider. And for the work, because we have done this work very long, I mean, relatively long time ago. So uh, I just mentioned that we, we don't consider all of them. We just consider some of them. So for, for the first beam forming, uh, hybrid beam forming work, we can see the like a multi antenna base station communicate with a multi antenna user over frequency selective fading. We can see that something like molecular absorption loss, high sparsity, and the carrier frequency offset. And based on this case, we propose new beam forming schemes, and we just evaluate the benefits. We show that for this case, again, I just ignore the beam forming de design details. We show that our proposed beam forming for one beam forming scheme it allow it approaches the fully digital beam forming like very likely. And for the second one, it has a lower performance, but it has an advantage in the complexity. So that is our first work. And then for the second work, we try to address another scenario that we try to, so comparing to maximize data rate, in this case, we try to serve you know, more users by using hybrid beam forming. So in this case, we consider a cluster-based multi-carrier beam division multiple access and we have hybrid beam forming at the base station. So in this case, what we do is that, um, like we have a base station and we want the base station to serve different users. 
for the base, different base users, like the users close to each other, they are grouped in one cluster. So for the users in the same cluster, we use distance aware multi carrier modulation that we introduced before. But for the users with different clusters, we use beam division multiple access to serve them. So the cluster can share the same terahertz spectrum resource to achieve a higher spectrum efficiency. So based on this, we have the design procedure, which I just ignore here. And then for the result, again, we can see that our proposed result has a better performance comparing to the existing results. But I think the, the, the key case here is that we try to maximize the connected, the connected um, user and uh, in this kind of like beamforming design. All right, so given the time constraint, we are just quickly mentioned what we have talked about in these three pieces of work. And finally, I would, I would like to share some open problems. I know that from the hardware design, we have the challenges in terahertz device, terahertz modulator, demodulators, and terahertz antennas. And I have known some of the hardware guy that are working super, super hard to deal with the terahertz hardware. And from the physical design, we try to, like if we want to do research, then I would suggest you to consider these kind of things. For example, we can develop more accurate and generalized analytical frameworks. We design the hardware efficient transmission reception design. We can see the advanced signal processing schemes to explore the practical characteristics, such as the multi-antenna architecture, the multi-wideband and distance aware transmission near far field propagation, robustness against imperfect channel knowledge, multi-connectivity design, and also consider other quality of service targets like massive connectivity, reliability, security, something like that. And then we, uh, also you can consider the joint design of terahertz communication with other technologies like integrated sensing and uh, communication, IIS, UAV. I think they are quite useful to be combined with terahertz communication. And finally, if your communication system is quite complicated, then you may resort to AI or machine learning to deal with the optimization or design problem. So that's some like future directions that I would like to share with everyone. And I think that will be the end of this talk. And uh, here are my publications. And here is the reference. And that is the end. Thank you very much.